Hello and welcome to topic three, lecture two. And in this lecture, we're going to be learning about the tools to measure crime. So in your textbook, they talk about three major tools that are used to measure crime. Uh, the Uniform Crime Report, oftentimes known as the UCR, the National Crime Victimization Survey, and self-report surveys. Um, and so make sure that you read about all three of these in your textbook. We're gonna cover the Uniform Crime Report and the National Crime Victimization Survey in this lecture. Uh, and then we're gonna briefly touch on general crime trends in the, the United States. You're gonna be reading more about this in your articles for this week, um, but I, I just wanted to do a little bit of a focus on the comparison between our perception of crime and the reality of crime in the United States. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's start with the Uniform Crime Reports. The Uniform Crime Reports are a, a report on the amount of crime that's taking place in the United States. Um, and it is issued by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. And every year, um, the FBI releases the Uniform Crime Report for the, the previous year, okay? Um, and it's probably the best known and most widely cited sources of criminal statistics in the United States. Um, the way the Uniform Crime Report um, system works is that uh, it, what is in the Uniform Crime Reports is based on the monthly reports of over 18,000 police departments within the United States. And so what the police departments do is that when a crime is reported to a local law enforcement agency, a department, uh, that they create a report and then they send that report to the FBI. And then all those reports get compiled at the end of the year, but also throughout the year as well. So we can sort of see what's going on like mid year. Um, not only are the crimes that are reported to local law enforcement included in the report, um, but also the number of arrests that are made by police agencies as well. Now, when you look at the Uniform Crime Report, you're going to see that they that they're um, they they put types of crimes in categories. So that there there's what's known as the Part One Index crimes, uh, and those are really the serious crimes in the United States. Okay, um, Part One crimes include violent crimes such as murder, non-negligent manslaughter, forcible rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. All of those are, uh, are, are, are crimes of violence. Uh, it also includes property crimes, but are, those are also serious crimes as well. And so property crimes such as burglary, that's entering into somebody's home to steal their, their things, um, theft, or uh, the legal term for that is larceny, motor vehicle theft and arson. All of those are part one crimes that are reported in the, in the Uniform Crime Reports. All other crimes except for traffic violations are what are known as part two crimes. So both of these kinds of crimes are reported monthly uh, to the FBI to be co compiled in the Uniform Crime Reports. Another thing that the UCRs report on is the number of cleared crimes that took place in the United States. Um, now, when when you when you when you hear the word a cleared crime, okay, that doesn't mean that somebody has been cleared of a crime. That is that they haven't been that they haven't been charged with a crime. That's not what it means. What a cleared crime is, or a clearance rate on crime, is that when at least one person is arrested and charged and turned over to the courts um, for the next steps to take place in the criminal justice process. Uh, and so I, I said on the previous slide that the UCR reports the number of arrests that take place. Well, that's related to the, the, the arrests that are related to the clearance rate. Uh, the United States, as we sort of know from the criminal justice funnel that we learned about a couple of weeks ago, uh, that when it comes to serious crimes, uh, uh, slightly more than 20% of all part one crimes are cleared, okay? Uh, the more uh, violent the crime is, the more likely that that, um, that crime is going to be cleared, with usually murder being the type of crime that has the highest level of clearance. So on this slide, we see two important pieces of information. On the top here, um, this part of the slide is showing us 
the percentage of crimes in the United States that are reported to the police, okay? And this is based on the National Crime Victimization Survey, which we'll be talking about in a moment. Uh, and this is basically people telling um, the, the people doing the survey whether or not they've reported a crime to the police. And as you see here, that motor vehicle thefts are, they have the highest level. It's the, it's, it's the crime most likely to be reported to police, probably because you're really pissed off that your car was stolen. Uh, and then, you know, you a violent crime of aggravated assault, uh, and then burglary, battery, simple assault, rape, sexual assault, and then personal theft and household theft, okay? So we sort of see it go from almost 80% of auto thefts being reported um, you know, to 30, uh, you know, to 26 here on, on the lower level, okay? Uh, and in a moment, we'll be talking about why certain kind, kinds of crimes are less likely to be reported to the police. Uh, now, uh, these these are, uh, on the bottom, are the percentage of crimes that have been cleared by police or solved, okay? And so, as I noted before, murder and manslaughter have the highest clearance rate um, and that uh, burglary and uh, motor vehicle theft have a really low clearance rate, okay? And so you might want to think about why that is. Why is it that murder, aggravated assault, rape um, have higher levels of, of clearance than uh, motor vehicle theft or burglary? Uh, and, you know, I think there are things that contribute to that. For one, we uh, put a lot of uh, police power be behind uh, uh, murder. The reason murder doesn't show up here is because people can't say that they've reported being murdered to the police, right, because they are, are murdered, okay? Uh, but it has a high clearance rate because a lot of attention is paid to murders or manslaughters. There's also a lot of evidence to go with, uh, particularly forensic evidence. Uh, other crimes get uh, less attention, and they're just a lot harder to solve because they're not may not be enough evidence to go with to actually like solve the crime. So the Uniform Crime Report is um, a, a really good and useful tool for measuring crime in the United States. Um, but there are weaknesses to the Uniform Crime Report and there are fact factors that affect just how valid the crime reports that are in the UCR are. Uh, one of the major factors affecting the validity of the UCR are reporting practices. Um, as we know from that last slide, not all crimes are reported to the police. And so if you don't report a crime to police, it does not get in the UCR. So the UCR is only crimes that are reported to police. And that when you look at the National Victim Survey, the National um, Victimization Survey that we'll talk about in a moment, you know, that's based on people saying whether or not they've been a victim of crime, not whether or not they've reported that crime to police. And as it says there, that according to those victim surveys, less than 40% of crimes are actually reported to the police for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, people may not report uh, a, a sexual assault because they might be embarrassed. Um, they might not report theft of their uh, thing, you know, household products like from their backyard because they're like, why bother? I, you know, it's not worth a lot. I don't want police to be involved in that. And so that is one of the downsides of the UCR. Um, there's also law enforcement practices and methodological issues with the UCR. Um, that the reports are voluntary. Um, so law enforcement agencies are not required to participate in reporting out data to the UCR. So the less law uh, enforcement agencies that participate in the UCR, the less accurate it's going to be. Um, also, the reports from agency to agency, from department to department, can vary in terms of its accuracy. It depends on how well trained the police officers are in terms of doing um, their reporting out to the to the the FBI. Uh, that it's that you can have variations in how one in, interprets a crime. Uh, a few years back in Milwaukee, uh, that there were. Um, uh, concerns about whether or not certain kinds of assaults were more likely to be classified as a simple assault rather than an aggravated assault. Because if you report it as an aggravated assault, it kind of makes Milwaukee seem like there's a higher level of violence. And so, you know, that classification was sort of left up to officers to make. Same with, was it aggravated assault or attempted rape? Um, that the way you classify a crime can differ um, from department 
to department and also to officer to officer. Uh, the UCR also um, that uh, at least up to today, and we'll talk about that in a second, that, that when there are multiple crimes that take place in one incident, only the most serious is recorded. So let's say that it is a homicide, but that the homicide was in a commission of a robbery and maybe there was some assault that went on as well. Only the homicide will re be reported in the UCR. And uh, no federal crimes are reported in the UCR. Uh, there's a separate report that is issued for that. So some of the limitations uh, associated with the validity of the Uniform, uniform Crime Report. So there are recent developments in how the UCR is reported and created that have raised concerns about the validity of the crime data that came out in uh, 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 the uh, 2020 and 2021 and potentially moving forward. Um, and so given some of the concerns about the validity of the UCR, um, that there was a move within uh, the, the Department of Justice where the FBI is housed um, to create a better system for reporting crimes, uh, that for local departments to report crimes to the United uh, to the, the to the FBI, and so in order to make the reporting of crimes more accurate and comprehensive, uh, the Uniform Crime Report switched from using what was known as the Summary Reporting System to NIVRS, the National Incident Based Reporting System. Um, that you'll read about uh, the National Inc Incident-Based Reporting System in your textbook. And that is actually a better way of reporting crimes that gives us a lot more information about the crimes. More crimes are included in reports that are sent to the FBI. We also get more demographic information about the crimes. And so the National Incident-Based Reporting System was seen as a better way of reporting crimes. And so starting in the 1990s, the FBI said, hey, let's start moving towards using NIBRS rather than SRS as our system for reporting crime to the FBI. Uh, and so in 2015, there was like sort of a, a full push for uh, agents, departments, law enforcement agencies to switch to NIBRS. And in 2021, that, that was the first year where um, uh, police departments had to use the national incident uh, based reporting system. Uh, and so what that means is, is that due to these changes in 2020, in 2021, 40% um, of law enforcement agencies did not report their crime data to the FBI. Okay. Um, because they had not made this switch to the the, the NIBRS, which is, um, one, it's a little bit more detailed reporting that goes on and more time consuming. Also, there's some concern that some law enforcement are going to make it look like crime is increasing and cities don't want their crime to look like it's increasing. So there was some resistance to that. And so uh, that uh, that the, the UCR crime data from 2021 and 2022, a lot of people are thinking that it's unreliable, uh, that it is um, missing key uh, data from big cities like New York City and Los Angeles, and also some of the police agencies in the most populous uh, states, California, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Florida, okay? And so the data is incomplete, and so that there's, uh, people aren't wanting to uh, look at that data from 2021 to 22 and feel confident about what that is reporting. I, I trust that this will get ironed out, hopefully, as more uh, cities get more comfortable with that. But uh, it's a shame that this has sort of happened at this time period. Maybe the FBI should have backed off and said, hey, because we're having these weird crime phenomenons uh, during the pandemic, that maybe they could have held off on and still accepted reports that used the old system so that we could have gotten a more complete picture of crime. But I thought you should be aware of that recent factor that's affecting its validity. 
The last thing I want to mention about the the UCR is the way that um, crime data is expressed in the report. And if you are studying crime and criminology, it's really important that you understand these differences so that you don't make errors in terms of how you think about how much crime is taking place in the United States. And so I'm actually just going to put all of these up here at the same time, okay? And then we'll go through these uh, individually, okay? Uh, and so um, that you know, one way we can express uh, crime data is just by raw figures, okay? And in that way, you just say, hey, how how many of this type of crime took place in the United States in said year, okay? And so here, I'm just using an example from 2017. And so it's like um, that in, so the raw figures is the number of actual crimes reported to the cops, right? And so for example, that in 2017, there were 300 and 319,000 robberies that occurred in the United States, okay? Um, and you know that's an important figure. It gives you a sense of, wow, that's a really big number, right? Um, however, you know, what if there are 10 billion people that live in the United States, right? I mean, it's still a large number. Any robbery matters, right? Um, but that that would, if there's 10 billion people that live in the United States, it's a smaller percentage of people who are, are, are victims of, of, of robbery. On the flip side of that, let's say that there's a million people that live in the United States, right? Well, that would mean that one out of every three person in the United States is a victim of robbery. And that gives is, is very different. So raw figures are important, but it really tells you an incomplete um, picture of crime in the United States. The crime rate is sort of a better way of looking at and thinking about crime. Yes, we have the raw figure, but crime rates set a rate of crime so that it doesn't really matter what the population is, okay? And so it's telling us the rate of crime per 100,000 people, okay? So it's like, if you had 100,000 people, of those 100,000 people, how many of them are victims of robbery, okay? Uh, the way you figure out the crime rate, it's the number of reported crimes times the total U.S. population. In this case, we're looking at the national times 100,000. OK, and so the U.S. robbery rate for 2017 was 98 per 100,000 inhabitants. So uh, of 100,000 people that live in the United States, 98 of them are victims of robbery. OK, that's still a high number, right? I mean, nobody wants to be the victim of a robbery. Um, but, you know, it's a lot less than 90, 98 out of 10,000 or 99, 98 out of 1,000, right? So it gives us a sense. We can also compare municipalities. We can find the crime rate in Wisconsin and compare it to the crime rate in uh, New York. And it allows us to compare uh, crime rates without having uh, making sure that we keep population in check. And then also the UCR reports changes over time, right? And so a lot of times when you look at the UCR, they'll say, hey, um, it, you know, that it, it will show us an increase or a decrease over time. So for example, um, that when you look at crime, the rate of robbery from 2008 to 2017, that we saw a 28% decrease in that crime, okay? So just be, make sure that you are understanding those different ways of expressing crime data because they're really important. So we get a, 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 like a clear understanding of that data. Another important tool for measuring crime in the United States is what's known as the NCVS or the National Crime Victimization Survey. Um, this survey is sponsored by the Bureau of Justice Statistics at the U.S. Department of Justice. Obviously, the Uniform Crime Report is produced by the FBI, which is also a part of the United States Department of Justice. And this tool is really different from the UCR. Um, this isn't about crimes that are reported to police, but rather as the title of this uh, tool suggests that this is a survey, okay? And that this is basically a national survey of U.S. households. Uh, it is a really large survey um, that 42,000 households are involved, um, which is about a total of 78,000 people. And that the, the household will uh, include in the survey any person living in that house that's 12 years old or 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 higher okay or or or, or, or older okay uh, and these households are randomly selected okay and that they are the like any survey that it is um you know uh, uh, may that you make sure that the 
that the that the the survey sample is representative of the broader population, right? So demographically, regionally, et cetera, uh, it's a good survey uh, sample. Uh, that it's also really large. Like when you think about surveys that you might read in the newspaper, which have a margin of error of plus or minus 4%, right? Not bad, but you know, not great. Um, this survey is much larger, right? All those people involved. And it has a really low uh, margin of error, which means that we can be fairly confident uh, in terms of, it, uh, of the, the validity uh, of, the, um, of the survey itself. Uh, the households stay in the survey for three years uh, and that they are interviewed um, uh, twice a year and they're interviewed as a household. Uh, the information that the survey collects is that it, it basically asks people, have you been a victim of crime? Uh, and then uh, that the person will say what the crime was, uh, that they'll give it, Obviously, we'll get demographic information about the victims, their ethnicity, their race, their education level. There's also that they say who was the offender. They won't name the person, but you'll get demographic information about the offender, the time and place that the crime occurred, whether um, their weapons, injuries involved, et cetera. Uh, so it's a pretty comprehensive survey that's trying to get an understanding of whether or not people have been victims of crime. Uh, and that, as we know, that one of the really important uses for the National Crime Victimization Survey is that uh, certain crimes are that are reported in the in the National Crime Victimiz uh, Victimization Surveys are found to go unreported in the UCR. A lot of those are sort of like um, personal crimes, like rape or sexual assault, or also minor crimes that people don't want to report to the police because they don't want the police to take time, like trying to find, um, you know, uh, items of low value that they've been, you know, stolen from you. Just as with the Uniform Crime Report, there are factors that affect the validity of the National Crime Victimization Survey um, that we are surveying individuals and individuals are um, can be uh, filled with uh, inaccuracies or incomplete data. So it could be that um, that maybe a victim, you might have over-reporting of a crime due to victim misinterpretation, uh, that maybe they thought their, their uh, wallet was stolen, but that actually it was lost. Uh, just as an example, under-reporting due to embarrassment, it's better than the UCR because it's easier to report uh, rape or child abuse to uh, a surveyor, uh, but still even reporting that to a surveyor can be embarrassing and people may not report it in any capacity. As with any survey, you really have to be aware of sampling era, error. You have to ask yourself, is the group that's being sampled representative of the broader population? Um, however, most social scientists find that the National Crime Victimization Survey is a very valid tool for measuring crime in the United States. Okay, the last part of this uh, lecture is going to be looking at the extent of crime in the United States and how the perception of how much crime is going on doesn't always correspond with the reality of how much crime is going on. Um, so how much crime is taking place in the United States, okay? How much crime is taking place now? How does that compare to the crime five years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago? Well, if you paid attention to the midterm elections, and I'm sure we're gonna hear this in the general elections in 2024, um, that when you listen to some elected officials, and this really played itself out in the Senate race in, 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 in Wisconsin, it would really be easy to conclude that crime is worse than it's ever been. Like it's, it's, it's never been this bad, right? Um, so is it, is crime really uh, 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 out of control? Is it the worst? Is it worse now than it's ever been? So the perception about crime in the United States is that the vast majority of Americans believe crime is getting worse and that, that there's more crime now than there has been in the past. And I'll show some uh, evidence about that perception to support this claim in one moment. The reality is though, that all types of crime have been on the decline in the United States since 1993. There have been some upticks in crime in 2016 and 17. It was a minor uptick, but that it returned soon after to a downward trend. Now, in 2020, 2021, we don't know yet for 2022, um, that 
there, uh, there has been a rise in homicides in the United States and a significant rise. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Um, and there have been some rises in violent crime. However, in general, there's a downward trend and it's nowhere near as bad as crime was in the 1990s and the 70s, 80s and in and the 90s. OK, so let's look at some data to support those claims. So here is a graph that tell, uh, gives you an idea of the perception of crime, uh, both in one's local area and also as the United States as a whole. And you can see that this comes from Gallup and Gallup's been basically ans asking this question for quite some period of time since 1972. And so the question that they're asking is, uh, they're asking people, is there more crime in your area than there has been in the, the last year? And also, do you think there's more crime in the United States than the, than the previous year? So more or less, okay? And then these are the respondents who said there's more, okay, there's more crime. And so you can definitely see some trends here uh, that the light green line is local, the dark green line is national, right? And so, uh, you know, that at the height of crime in the United States, was, which was in the 1980s and 90s, you know, you really see that, you know, like 80, over 80 percent of people in the United States felt that there was more crime uh, this year than last year, which is accurate. Right. And then, you know, it starts going down uh, here in the United States. But then uh, in 2001, when crime continues to decline in the United States, you actually see that, you know, strong majorities of people are still saying there's more and more and more crime. Uh, that, you know, there's less people who think there's more crime in their area, but it has similar trends, okay? So the perception is pretty solidly, particularly at the national level, that year after year after year, people think there are more crime, even during time periods where crime has been on the decline. Now, this is a great graph, although it's a little uh, outdated, not really outdated, but it's limited in terms of that it only goes to 2015. Uh, but we can see that, uh, you know, the, the previous slide shows that the trend in terms of the perception of crime is actually continues beyond 2015. So what this shows, and let me put on my magic pen here, what this shows is uh, the, uh, the green line is people who say that there's more crime in the United States, okay? And so that, as we saw in the previous slide, it goes down and then it continues to go up, up, up from 2000. And it continues beyond 2015, even though that doesn't show it on the chart. What this chart shows is it compares it to the actual violent rate of uh, violent crime victimization rate from the National Crime Victimization Survey. And so this is asking people, have they been a victim of violent crime? OK. And as we see in the 1990s, high and the crime is going lower in the United States. OK. And so there's less uh, less victims of violent crime. So by 2016, you know, there's, uh, you know, 20 people out of a, uh, a thousand that report being a a victim of violent crime. And so here we can really see this gap between the reality of crime and the perception of crime. Here's a graph that looks specifically at the uh, victimization of violent crimes. Uh, it, it kind of breaks it down uh, from simple assault being this, let me put my magic pen on here, this area here, uh, the aggravated assault here, uh, robbery and, and, and sexual assault, okay? And so you can see, uh, again, that as it says there, federal surveys showed no increase in U.S. violent crime rates since the start of the pandemic, okay? And so we see that there is a decrease starting the 90s of violence in the United States and that, you know, even, you know, uh, you know, here's the pandemic, see a little bit of an uptick, but, you know, really still pretty much on track for a downward trend. And this shows a very similar trend, but looking at the the uh, the uniform crime report. So we see a downward trend uh, in terms of violent crime with a little bit of a tick up here. So you might be asking yourself, wait a second, Professor Hankinson, like they all we hear about are this increase in crime, increase in crime. Where where is that perception coming from? OK, well, that perception is coming from the reality of the uptick in homicides in the United States. OK, and that is a reality. OK, so this shows you the murder rate in the United States. Again, the rate. So it's not like it's it's checked for population. And going from the 1970s, okay, with the height in the 1990s, and then we see a, a, a steady decline in, uh, in uh, homicides 
but that we see an uptick in the 19th, uh, in the 27, 1617s, and whoop, we see an uptick here during the pandemic. Okay. Now, so that is, I mean, it's one of the kinds of crimes that gets the most attention in the United States. So that can help us understand that perception. But keep in mind that it is uh, not as high as it was in the 1990s, but it is a cause for concern. Keep in mind that this is not a phenomenon of homicides just in big cities that we've seen post pandemic during the pandemic, an uptick in homicides in small towns, big towns, rural areas, urban areas, red states, blue states, right? That th 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 there's something about the pandemic that has brought out the murderers in us. Um, and also a lot of guns were bought during the pandemic. And oftentimes there's a correlation between uh, the number of guns in the society and the rates of homicide. So just something to keep in mind. So in conclusion, there are just some things I'd like you to think about. Uh, one, I'd like you to think about what shapes your perception of crime. Um, when you think about the way you perceive crime, is it your lived experience, the neighborhood that you live in? Is it the movies and TV shows you watch? It, do you read a lot of news, social media? So what are some of the factors that shape your perception? Uh, does your perception align with the reality of crime? If it does, why do you think it does? If it doesn't, why, why doesn't it? Um, and when we think about the gap between perception and reality in the United States, is, is that something we should be concerned about? Uh, why or why not? And then finally, what potential impact does that gap between the perce perception and the reality of crime have on politics and policy in the United States? So just some things to think about. Thanks a lot for listening. I appreciate your time and attention, and I will talk to you again soon.